Okay, well, I think we might start. So our next paper is going to be given by William Ackworth from Allen Consulting, and uh, his uh, provocative title is Trading Carbon in your April Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 55th um, RE's Annual Conference. Thank you, John. My name is Will Ackworth from the Allen Consulting Group. So recently, the Carbon Farming Initiative um, has been receiving a lot of attention by both landholders, Australian businesses and also abroad. And today I'd like to discuss some of the potential challenges associated with establishing a functioning market for offsets under the Carbon Farming Initiative within Australia. So just at the top I'd like to discuss, uh, convey the key messages that I want to get across today. First of all, as we've heard um, from Rebecca there, while there does appear to be some low cost options for agricultural abatement, there could be some substantial hidden costs associated with market participation. These hidden costs have the potential to erode the market and significantly diminish the effectiveness of the policy tool. Therefore, the scheme should be designed in a way that actually reduces these transaction costs and also increases the incentives for market participation. And just as one, one potential option, I'd like to discuss um, the possibilities for pooling and how these might reduce um, transaction costs and increase incentives. So, by means of a quick outline, today I want to give a very brief overview of the Carbon Farming Initiative before quickly discussing some of the um, options and costs for abatement in the agricultural sector. I'd then like to discuss the, the, core, the key issues that are gonna, may result in large transaction costs associated with this scheme before presenting offset pooling as a potential mechanism for reducing those. So, starting at the very beginning, what is an agricultural, what is an offset? Basically, a permit that is generated through sequestration or abatement activities, and then once verified, can be traded to emitters or otherwise in domestic and international markets. So, in this way, offset permits represent new income streams for Australian landholders. So, the Carbon Farming Initiative essentially will establish a functioning market for offsets within Australia. It was announced uh, about halfway through of last year by the Labor government, and it's hopefully to be legislated by mid-2011. This scheme has been designed deliberately broad to maximise the um, opportunities for carbon abatement in the agricultural sector. And in this way, it includes both Kyoto-compliant offsets and also non-Kyoto-compliant voluntary credits. So the voluntary credits will need to be certified against the National Carbon Offset Standard or if they're to be sold internationally against other um, voluntary carbon standards. Whereas the Kyoto compliant offsets would need to be um, certified in line with international accounting frameworks. So I'd now like to move on quickly again to the opportunities. So, and um, I, yeah, we, we've just had a um, great presentation on some of this stuff, so that's um, very helpful for myself. We don't understand much of the science behind it, but. Basically, the, um, one of the premises behind the Carbon Farming Initiative is that there's many opportunities within the agricultural sector to actually achieve abatement at very little or potentially even negative cost. So these negative cost um, opportunities have been coined no regrets um, carbon abatement actions. And they're represented here as the areas underneath the marginal abatement cost curve. So um, we did hear a few, other, a few examples. Basically, methane and nitrous oxide represent the residual energy being expelled from the farm system. So better targeting of feed or fertilizer application could actually result in improved farm efficiency as well as lowering the operating costs and reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the same time. So some of these activities make sense regardless of a carbon price. Other examples uh, may include minimum till cropping as well as improved grazing regimes. Other than the no regrets abatement opportunities, there are also um, opportunities that require trading off the revenues associated with offset um, generation with um, the revenues that come from agricultural production. And these are the ones above the, um, above the zero line on the marginal abatement cost curve. Um, okay, however, under any offset trading scheme, we need to, offsets need um, to be credited permits need to be demonstrated that they're actually in addition to um, activities that would have happened under a business as usual scenario. And that's the additionality criterion. So many people have raised concerns as to actually the additionality of some of these 
no regrets opportunities because um, there may be other incentives that to um, undertake them which might occur in the future regardless of the carbon price. So the interpretation of this additionality criteria under the Carbon Farming Initiative is going to be quite critical in terms of the total spectrum of abatement opportunities that are available to landholders and also the, the cost of those abatement opportunities. Um, I'm not exactly clear how, how that's going to be resolved and I believe further research is required to actually understand the full spectrum of no regrets opportunities that are actually out there and also their additionality. So now moving on to the um, transaction costs and uncertainty that are associated with the carbon farming initiative and how um, these may sort of diminish the effectiveness of the scheme. So the, the direct costs of um, emission abatement are only one of the costs that are involved or that affected landholders decision to actually participate in the market. Also important are the transaction costs associated with actually undertaking the investment and trading the permits. Transaction costs increase the total cost of doing business and in that way actually shrink the size of the market. Um, I think that there's significant risk that the transaction costs associated with the carbon farming initiative could be quite high and um, could actually result in the total costs rising above um, that of the permit price and potentially resulting in a missing market. So today I want to go through um, some specific potential transaction costs in terms of producer participation setting baselines and monitoring and compliance. So in thinking about what the other costs that are um, involved in actually participating in this market, um, this figure here is produced by the Department of Climate Change and it's actually the steps that are involved in producing an offset credit and e each one of these steps for a producer entails further costs. So to begin producing offset credits, a landholder must first select the relevant methodology, become a registered entity, have a project approved by the scheme administrator and then undertake annual or some form of reporting. Then once the, the project has been approved and actually implemented, the landholder must then sort of navigate relatively foreign complex um, carbon markets to actually trans, um, transpose the, well, to generate the actual income from his offset or her offset permits. Um, further, there may be some additional costs associated with audits and other compliance mechanisms imposed by the scheme regulator. So the sum of all these activities could actually increase the total cost of, uh, of generating that permit quite substantially above what the actual um, abatement cost has been estimated. So second of all, setting baselines. So in any offset system, uh, you, you, need to, you can only credit offsets for against, um, against sort of measured baselines. However, assessing these baselines is, it can be sub subjective, complex, and generally administratively burden burdensome. And um, as I've said, the, the CFI has been ambitiously um, established to be very broad, and therefore abatement uh, based, well, sorry, emission baselines will need to be set up for different agricultural activities across different regions and different industries. Further, these baselines will need to be updated to reflect changed farm processes and government policy. So again, actually getting this up and running and establishing these baselines could put more substantial costs on the actual scheme. So then, there will also be monitoring and compliance costs. The introduction of a carbon price will actually will, will generate the incentive for some form of abatement, but it will also generate an incentive to actually over-report on, on the actual emission reductions. Therefore, compliance cannot just be assumed and monitoring and enforcement will be required. Now, given the dispersed nature of the agricultural production, monitoring and enforcement costs could be substantial. As an example, Canadian-based research indicates that monitoring of individual agricultural abatement projects could be as high as 18 Canadian dollars per tonne of carbon dioxide actually abated. So, we can conceive that with actually limited government, limited government budgets may suggest that um, enforcement will be an imperfect and there may be significant non-compliance. So non-compliance will be an issue for, for two, two reasons, I guess. First of all, it will actually diminish the perceived integrity of the credits produced here, um, actually having a negative impact on demand. But it's also important for the government because if they're actually um, crediting Kyoto-compliant permits, um, it, non-compliance has implications for them meeting their, um, their 2012 emission reduction targets. 
So as well as transaction costs, there's also costs associated with uncertainty. Um, when we have, when we, we don't have the techniques or technologies to actually um, measure these mission abatement activities, therefore we must use estimation techniques. And when, whenever you're estimating, there's an um, uncertainty and potential to overestimate or underestimate the actual um, emission reductions. So solutions put forward to this has been to introduce discount rates or trading ratios. So when there's increased uncertainty around the emission or the estimation technique, we actually devalue the, um, the offset credit. But this is heavily biased against the agricultural sector <coughs> and, as it, and it completely ignores the potential for an upside in the, um, th that is the estimation techniques may actually result in, in estimated lower. And so these sort of um, trading ratios completely ignore that potential upside. And this again is a, another cost on the system. So now turning to pooling. Um, pooling is basically when agricultural producers group together to sell um, their produce and it has a long history in Australian agriculture. Pooling has the potential to reduce transaction costs, through co-regulation reduce the costs associated with compliance, and also manage uncertainty. So in terms of reduced transaction costs, um, pooling may allow for the aggregation up of many small scale abatement projects which will spread the fixed um, transaction costs associated with project, project approval and participating in the market and reduce the unit cost of emission reductions. Now, this, this type of activity has proven very successful, well, it seems to be proving successful in the clean development mechanism through the programs of activities approach. Pooling also introduces the option for co-regulation. Co-regulation involves both public and private partnerships to work, working together to ensure compliance. Now, it's in, it's in both the, the, the pool operator and the Australian government's interest that you have compliance, because as I've said before, the Australian government requires compliance in accurately estimating their emissions profile and meeting their Kyoto commitments. And the pool operator also requires compliance to ensure the integrity of the offset credit. Um, so in this way, the pool could operate under, um, condition, under a code of best practice and actually give their own individual incentives for, the, for their operators to um, comply with, with the contracts that they've signed. And in that way, government sanctions will be, can, will be sort of used as only a last option. And as, as I've said, this has the potential to reduce the actual cost of enforcement while increasing compliance. Um, so, oops. Okay, sorry, oh, man, pools can also manage um, uncertainty. Yeah, sorry. Um, because when, when, you have a, when you actually get abatement activities from a diverse range of, um, well, emission reductions from a diverse range of abatement activities, the pool in itself will, will um, experience much less vol volatility than an individual project. So that way investors will have greater assurance that the, the permits that they've purchased is going to be the actual, um, re represent actual emission reductions. And this takes away, well, reduces the need for such things as discount ratios or trading ratios. So, um, in, by means of conclusions, uh, while, while it does seem that the carbon farming initiative could, uh, they could harness some low cost abatement within the agricultural sector, there could be substantial hidden costs associated with market participation. Pooling represents one potential solution, but there are possibly many more. And I think further research is, is required to actually quantify the size of these transaction costs and also to develop the scheme in a way that's going to reduce transaction costs and maximise incentives for participation. Thank you.